All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, uh, Assets of the Universe, episode number four. I'm your host, Luke Kerner, with Blockchain Co-Investors. We're a crypto fund to fund invested in 26 of the leading crypto VCs around the world. And as believers and investors in the metaverse, we launched this show to help ourselves and the broader community put the metaverse uh, into context uh, by letting leaders in the space share their views on where we are, what's working, and where we're going. We've got two great guests today, uh, including William Quigley, co-founder of NFT uh, Blockchain Wax, uh, or Worldwide Asset Exchange. Um, and a fun fact is that uh, the very first VC meeting I ever had was with William in March of uh, 2000 when he was at Ideal Lab Capital. Um, I'm pretty sure he passed. Uh, our second guest is uh, uh, Jacob uh, Smilovitz. Is that the right pronunciation? Yeah, great. Smilovitz, however. Smilovitz with the Churning Group or TCG, an uber successful consumer VC with a big focus on uh, crypto and the metaverse. So welcome, Jacob. Thanks. And where are you zooming in from? Thanks, Lou. Uh, I'm zooming in from Metro Detroit, actually. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Cool. Here's Drew. Hey, Drew. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and lastly, I'd like to introduce uh, my co-host, uh, Drew Austin with uh, Red Sea Ventures. Red Beard, Red Beard. Red Beard, I'm sorry. <laughs> There is a Red Sea Ventures. There is, but you yes. just, if you ever need a look, just quick, quick reminder. I know I, I cut it close this time. I get yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, you know, Jacob and William are each going to talk for about, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, six to eight minutes, um, just sharing some of their views. And after they talk, uh, we'll open it up to questions from the audience. So, if you have a question, put it into the Q and A box on chat section on Zoom. And mm -hmm. if we pick your question, we'll let you know via chat. And when it's your turn to ask, we'll uh, bring you up uh, on stage, open up your audio and video, and you can ask the questions and, and follow-ups yourself. And so with that, you know, I'd like to turn it over to Jake. Cool. Thanks, Lou. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for having me here. Um, super cool show that, that you guys are building, and, and great to see you as always, Drew. Um, yeah, so I figured I'd just start with a little bit of background on TCG, who we are, and, and, and what we do. Um, uh, TCG as a firm has been around for, for about 12 years um, and has been solely focused on building uh, great breakthrough uh, consumer businesses. Um, we tend to, in our heritage, have focused in a few sort of core areas, and I sort of broadly bucket those as kind of creator-focused brands, businesses like Barstool Sports and the, the passion and fandom that's been built around um, around that that company, Meat Eater in the hunting and fishing space, Food Fifty Two in the in the cooking space. Um, all these businesses really started around sort of content creator community, and then layered on uh, some some different types of commerce on top of that. And then we also have a lot of heritage investing in uh, collectibles related businesses. So um, I sit on the board of Hodinkee, which is the leading. Uh, content to commerce business in the in the wristwatch space. We're also uh, large investors in Collectors Universe and and Golden Auctions in the sports trading card space. So um, what's been fascinating to to watch play out is basically how our heritage and sort of these these creator focused businesses and and collectibles have um, really uh, uh, dovetailed into the NFT and uh, blockchain space over the past. 12 months. So, so for the past year, I've been leading a team internally focused on what we've been calling the everyone is an investor thesis, which is really centered around this idea that, um, that people are spending a lot of time online and they want to make money online, put money to work online. And, and it's, it's both a passion area, it's entertainment, it's fun. Um, and so through that work, we really ended up going down a, a sort of a blockchain and and crypto wormhole. Um, and what we realized was that, you know, some of the next great businesses across the entertainment, sports, media, and, and gaming landscape uh, are gonna be built on the blockchain. And there's gonna be a lot of consumer businesses to be built there. So, uh, so we invested in February uh, in, in Dapper Labs, which is obviously the NBA top shot parent company. And we think really built 
um, through their product experience uh, married with the IP that they had. Um, really the one of the first major breakthrough mainstream use cases and adoption drivers for, for NFTs writ large. Um, and then uh, over the summer, uh, I led uh, our investment in a company called Zed Run, which is an NFT horse racing uh, platform that I assume anyone watching a show about the metaverse is, is loosely aware of. Um, but uh, an incredible business where people can buy horses on the primary market, they can uh, trade them on a secondary market, they can breed their horses together, they can race uh, their horses together, they can build a stable, um, there's jobs to be done uh, in this ecosystem. Uh, so just a, a huge potential in terms of gaming, uh, uh, media, and uh, blockchain all merged into a single platform. Um, and then we, we, we also were small investors in OpenSea seed round in uh, 2018. Um, and so as we, as we did this work, you know, we, we really looked out across the landscape and what we heard time and time again from founders and, and industry experts that we were meeting with was that, um, you know, a lot of the, the skills and heritage that we've built, um, building these sort of consumer focused businesses, um, really, really uh, has a lot of resonance in this space and, and can really help to build these businesses uh, uh, on the blockchain. And so we're, uh, you know, we, we feel like our expertise in things like go-to-market strategy, building an organic funnel, marketing, content, building world-class product and tech organizations. We've spent the last decade getting really good at that. And um, we, we feel like that sort of value add uh, has, has a lot of differentiation and, and a lot of, uh, of value to bring to, to these businesses. And so, um, you know, we're, we're very focused on finding consumer businesses built on the blockchain that, uh, you know, speak not only to the 10 million people with MetaMask wallets today, but also that, you know, the hundreds of millions of other uh, users on the internet who uh, the blockchain can deliver real user value to, unlock new use cases, new ways of forming community and identity. Um, and so we feel like there's a lot of exciting work to be done and our angle focused on distribution has a lot of resonance. And so um, super excited to be here today to, to chat uh, with you, Lou, and, and everyone else and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Sure, so thanks, Jake. And so, um... You know, Zed Run obviously a super interesting company. Uh, you know, they're out there, they're operating. Kind of any lessons learned from from that investment? Uh, yeah, work with Drew Austin as much as possible, and, and everything will work out. Put uh, <laughs> that down, everybody. Um, yeah, I think there's I think there's plenty of of lessons to be learned. I mean, first, I think you know, overall, it's still early days for these businesses in in a lot of ways, and so you know. What, what works and, and starts to break through, there's a lot of infrastructure left to be built under it. So, you know, hiring has been a huge focus. I, I know it's a huge focus of every one of these companies, um, getting world-class leadership in place. Um, you know, the, the founding team there is, is incredible and they've, they've really built a, an incredible business over the last three years. And so a lot of our focus has been on how do we come in and support them in the right ways and, take some of the, the stress off their plate um, and, uh, and handle some of the stuff that's, you know, more, less value add and more let them focus on the big important ideas for the business. And so um, uh, I, I think that's the first. And then the second is, you know, allowing people to build organic community around your product couldn't be more important in this space. And the amount of, like media businesses, data businesses, um, Discord channels, all of that kind of community that's developed organically around Zed um, has been inspiring to watch. And we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to hone that and help those folks be successful um, and really like create a, a broader platform that's, that extends far beyond what is the sort of like central entity of Zed. Um, and so that's that's really been a big area of focus, um, and and what 
we, we feel like that that's the kind of thing that's hard to replicate. And so we really wanna, wanna be mindful of that and treat it with the right care and respect. And Jake, real quick, uh, like, would you say that there is a different, like, as a as a fund, you guys obviously invest in, you know, blockchain companies as well as, you know, obviously non non blockchain companies. Yeah. Would you say that, that that there are tactical differences to the types of challenges that you that you face when working and supporting the portfolio companies like a Zed, etc., that are that are different in compared to the tactical challenges of 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 maybe a collectible universe or you know some of the other types of companies you work with. Yeah, definitely. I mean, well, and just to just to clarify, we we have we are historically growth stage investors, um, but we feel like there's a lot of interesting uh, things going on earlier stage uh, within crypto, and you know the stages are obviously completely fungible. Um, but uh, but we're we're sort of full stack early to to growth stage investors in, in the crypto space, um, and yeah, I think I think it's hard. I think that you know. I think there's been a lot of discussion about the economics being front and center at the beginning of these businesses. Um, and so there's a whole other challenge of how do you support a business that is hockey sticking and bringing in a ton of revenue simultaneously. Um, and as they're trying to sort out what the business really is and what the ongoing model really is. And so I think really trying to take that like longer term view is is critical. And then I think the other thing is, you know, if if um, in terms of driving mainstream adoption, you know, the the distribution challenges of a Hodinkee or a Meat Eater or a Food 52 are, are is sort of well worn path uh, a track at this point. Um, and I think that you know. The, the early stumbling blocks of getting someone a MetaMask, getting them to OpenSea, getting them their first horse, helping them, you know, build a stable, like all of that kind of work is still, I think, in, in the earliest stages. And so we feel like there's a lot of work to be done on the on the onboarding front in, in a lot of these businesses um, if, if we're going to really help to unlock a lot of mainstream adoption. Actually, very cool. Well, thanks, uh, thanks for sticking around for the Q&A portion. Um, and uh, welcome, uh, William. And where are you, you're calling in from, uh, from Europe? It looks like a cave. <laughs> it does look like a cave, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm in Ibiza right now, but yeah. Ah, very, cool. very nice. Well, thanks hopefully, for taking the time your... Yeah, hopefully you can hear me. Yeah, um, no, we can hear you fine. And uh, thanks for taking the time out of- uh, awesome out of your travels um but obviously you know wax is in the center of uh, of, of a lot of things and you know you you know a real og um you know uh, uh you know having been there at the i know you're right you were at the first ethereum meeting and you know so great to have you back here i mentioned how actually you were the very first vc meeting i ever had in, in march of 2000 <laughs> um wow so, so we love <laughs> just you know yeah exactly would love to, i've had a few since um uh, you know, would love to just, you know, kind of get your macro views on, um, you know, on where we are and, you know, and, and what, uh, you know, where, where you think we're going. Macro views of, uh, crypto or macro yeah. views of, I mean, and, and, well, crypto, metaverse, NFTs, the you know, show's asset of the metaverse, obviously mm -hmm. NFTs are, you know, major assets of the, you know, of, you know, yeah. are the, kind of the assets of the universe, but, you know, uh, you know, I know wax sure. deals in a lot of different assets. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I've been talking a lot lately about just general crypto. Um, so uh, obviously, we're at a point we're at a point right now where the amount of activity happening off, let's say uh, Ethereum and in Bitcoin is just steamrolling. That's not because either well, Bitcoin doesn't really do anything but uh, be a store of value. But Ethereum, Ethereum's doing great. And as you noted, I was early in that. I love Ethereum, but there's just so many other chains and so many other industries that are uh, happening right now that you can't keep up. DeFi you, alone. Sorry, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt, William, but what are your thoughts on the uh, the different, the multi-chain strategy and like, you know, Ethereum versus another chain, like, you know, how do you yeah. see this? How do you see yeah, this it'd be great. And, and just for, for the folks, William, who don't know, can you just quickly kind of maybe just also give your background and, and explain quick what, uh, you know, what WAX is exactly? Sure. Sure, sure. So background, uh, entertainment industry, CFO of uh, 
a licensing division at Disney. And then I left that, thank God. <laughs> and I started the first uh, consumer internet venture capital fund. Uh, we had a lot of, uh, it, 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 what I learned from that experience was uh, I worked with two other guys. They were great guys. I was good, but uh, we knew nothing about venture capital, but we still had uh, for many years, the, the number one uh, venture capital fund in the world uh, from an IRR perspective uh, during that era, uh, because uh, we, uh, we didn't know anything about venture, but we sure had the right timing. And one <laughs> thing I've learned about investing is timing, timing makes up for virtually everything else. Have a strategy of a, if you're interested in a sector, you time that sector right, you're going to make money. And that's happened yeah. with everything, certainly, I've done. I'm, so, I'm uh, sure you saw Bill Gross's TED Talk. I did indeed. And we talked yes. a lot about just that every, you know, hundreds of investments. And what mattered more than anything else was the right timing because timing uh, makes up for so many other sins that you commit, <laughs> you know, when you're early and, and, uh, uh, there's a lot of territory to claim. You can make a lot of mistakes, right? You only need to get a few things right. So um, uh, I uh, was, uh, so you could call it, I focused on Internet 1.0, mostly consumer, because that's what I was working on at Disney. And uh, did a lot of great investments. Uh, go to the inventor of the pay for placement business model for search, uh, Net Zero, uh, MP3, uh, PayPal. A lot of a lot of payments stuff we did and a lot of music e-music free music everything music uh and uh and then uh i was a gamer and then it turned out with the the emergence of uh of what became massively online multiplayer games uh using the internet to aggregate players i started to get focused a lot on the economies of those and uh I got involved with the company that was the very first company to trade virtual items for fiat. And that was a company called uh, uh, My Supercells. The founder of that is now my partner. And uh, that company and Jonathan uh, invented the concept of taking video game virtual items and uh, having a marketplace for people to trade them back and forth. The marketplace being the digital escrow agent. And that was a needed function, otherwise, you know, it's a Mexican standoff. Someone's got the money, <laughs> someone's got the object. How do you do it? A lot of fraud. He came in, he fixed that, grew that to, uh, I was on the board there, grew it to the largest uh, uh, video game virtual item marketplace in the world. But that whole market globally in 2008 when he sold it was uh, $10 billion, the secondary market. And that was because uh, video game virtual items had in-game utility. And because of that, uh, you didn't need many of them. And so when the skins market, by the way, came around in 2013 and 14, we knew that market was going to be much, much bigger. And it was, and we created the largest uh, marketplace for video game virtual items. That's called Opskins. But uh, uh, the guy who founded the video game virtual item marketplace, uh, Jonathan, he got me into crypto. Uh, because after he sold his company, read the Stoshi White Paper, thought it was cool. I, like a lot of venture capitalists, have scar tissue from previous investments. I did some of those early deals uh, in, a, in a micro transaction companies, uh, uh, Magic Internet Money, Beans and Flues. Those, those are the names of these companies. They didn't work. I didn't really understand why they didn't work, but they didn't work because the currency could be debased because there wasn't a blockchain. So uh, he finally convinced me that a blockchain makes up for those sins. And so uh, uh, I did what I did with, with internet. I, we started a, a fund and we also started incubating, which is what we had done at Idea Lab. And uh, we took the view that initially there'd need to be an infrastructure layer, then there would need to be an application layer, and then there would need to be uh, ancillary services, data uh, services, those sorts of things. And so we've, we've uh, been following that path uh, we uh, were the first guys to put an intelligence layer on a blockchain that was MasterCoin. MasterCoin made one mistake. They put an intelligent layer on a Bitcoin blockchain and they didn't see any reason why you would need an intelligent layer on a blockchain. Uh, so that team said, we're going to abandon that. It did do one thing though. We created Tether from that. But uh, uh, so MasterCoin did have a purpose, but it was one thing. 
and uh, and it became the stepping stone for what became Ethereum. And uh, Ethereum kind of was a purpose-built blockchain for smart contracts. And uh, and out of that came our belief that eventually skins, video game virtual items, were going to be tokenized, and that we couldn't do it initially because you know consensus mechanisms, speeds, and whatnot. But in 2017, we thought the tech is right around the corner. Uh, let's start building, and uh, we, we figured out the right consensus mechanism. We launched Wax uh, today. Uh, certainly, more NFT transactions than any other blockchain, uh, and I think certainly the biggest NFT wallet in the world. We probably got about seven million NFT collectors in that wallet. Obviously, those numbers are very small. All of us in crypto, uh, compared to Instagram or whatever internet based audiences, but that took 20 years. And uh, with UI improvements and with more easy to understand consumer applications, you know, we'll get there to the same scale. And so now I would say my main focus is what we broadly now call the metaverse. Uh, and it's uh, anything where there's an integration of e-commerce, uh, trading and, uh, and, and virtual items. Uh, is where I'm focused uh, with, with, because of my historical experience with the focus, a lot of focus on uh, fashion and entertainment. Uh, though I think tokenization, of course, has great and broad applications around things like DeFi. It's one of the core ingredients of, of DeFi. But, uh, but I, uh, I've, uh, I'm at a point in my life where I like to indulge in things I enjoy. I enjoy consumer products, I believe, I believe uh, all the world's consumer products, or most of them, will have digital twins within 10 years. Uh, uh, NFTs will be that digital twin for them. And of course, Wax is building a lot in that area. Uh, NFTs, I think, as everybody on this uh, call understands, uh, 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 media files are one way you can use NFTs, but NFTs have applications across every industry, probably on Earth. And, uh, you know, more than likely, it'll take more than wax in the existing chain to do that. I suspect there'll be many thousands of chains launched uh, around NFTs, like like any other branch of technology. Because as, as markets get big, you start to subdivide into specialization, and that's going to happen there. But NFTs will—I can't imagine—they'll be less than trillions of dollars <laughs> of NFTs in ten years. I mean, certainly if you take video gaming, 200 billion annually of just virtual objects, and that's annual. You add in movies, music, uh, 300 billion a year. Uh, NFTs are that plus all the other stuff. So it's a great place to be focused. If there are yeah. any developers thinking of working in the technology <laughs> space, certainly do something in blockchain and the NFT space, it's wide open. So well, uh, going back to the question I was asking before, what are your what are your thoughts on, you know, why do we need more blockchains in Ethereum? And like, let's what I'm also curious about is, as Ethereum evolves, let's say we let's say we're two three years down the road, Ethereum 2.0 is successful and it's in a better position. How does the marketplace for multi blockchains work, and what is the coexistence of Ethereum? Do you think there's some kind of like pillar? store of record for NFTs that maybe is Ethereum, then everyone else has their own experiences, capabilities, and purposes. Like I'm trying to think like a lot of times, like my friend, I'm in a lot of, you know, these groups of chats and all that kind of stuff where we talk about crypto and NFTs all day. And a lot of the discussion mm. we have is like, okay, well, for example, let's talk about, you know, Polygon. Polygon was a big, you know, Zed took off on Polygon. Um, a lot of people bought Matic tokens, but we, you know, we say like, what happens to Polygon in three years from now? Or, you know, if Ethereum takes off, is there still a need for a layer two if layer one solve their problems? Like, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on all this. By the way, on that last point, I, I that last, just that last point, I, you know, I build stuff, right? So layer two sucks. <laughs> well, layer two does not take away the problems of layer one. I mean, if you build on that, you know that. So uh, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. Like, like, Anything that's going to scale is going to be layer, layer one, or it's just not going to be blockchain. Of well, course, I can create layer, layer two. two. Layer two seems like a band aid right now. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. So we're not going to. No, I won't shed any new light for you because we both very much agree on that. But that's the smaller point. To your other point, though, I, I have to reveal something. Uh, 
twice today in speaking to groups, they've asked me this question. And I guess uh, maybe it's like the way a fish looks at water, it doesn't really see it. Uh, it's so hard for me to understand the question, but I'm, but I'm, but I'm going to try. So the question being, why do we need more than Ethereum? Why do we need all these blockchains? Uh, so when I started uh, Idea Lab Capital Partners, the first consumer in an venture fund, there were I think there were two thousand websites in the world, and uh, uh, we had a hard time raising money because people, very smart people, said, "Why on earth?" Do we need another website? There's 2,000 websites. There's like 50 websites. And you know what they do? All they do is they sell merchandise. Why on earth would you need more than 50? And here's how I answered that. When I was the CFO of Disney licensing, we had 15,000 licensees. We had like 35 licensees that just sold wafflers. Why do you need 35 <laughs> licenses? Because humans like variety. Or why is there a need to have anything more than one retail chain? Why can't you put everything into Walmart? You, and by the way, the answer is you can, but no one would like it. Why do we have more than one restaurant chain? Sell hamburgers, sell hot dogs, sell pizza, sell spaghetti, sell Indian food, sell Chinese food, sell ice cream, sell donuts. The reason is because people's attention is limited. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking even about the consumers. I'm talking about the developers. So when you go to build something, you start out building, a, I don't know, a, an airplane. Maybe you could add a shovel and make it a tractor too. I don't know. But the mm -hmm. thing is, you want to build the airplane. And you become specialized. And pretty soon, there's different types of airplanes. And now, what are you? Are you a passenger airplane, a jet? You're a refueler? Are you a helicopter? And so as markets expand, it is inevitable that you and your team become more narrow. So I would make an argument that if you're an Ethereum-based developer, you there's this, there's this impossibly strong force pushing you to DeFi because mm -hmm. that's the that's the ticket that's paying the bills. That's what people want to see. That's what people want to do. So you're ultimately when you build technology, your customers really kind of dictate what you do. So it, it, Ethereum it's, is going to become a DeFi chain. I, I, okay. So I, I I align with what you're saying here. And it's actually funny because I, I think someone kind of answered a similar question to me recently. It's like the reason why we need multiple chains, uh, multiple blockchains is culturally, which was kind of the question you like community and culturally driven. Some people yeah. just are going to feel that they, that they relate to the people that are building Wax or building Tezos or building Solana more than they built, more than they um, relate or find that community yeah. that they're looking for within Ethereum. I guess the, the thing that I struggled with and I, and I don't know that I, I'm still clear on yet is that you know, if the idea is that Ethereum is decentralized, which means that it's come that you can build what you want on it, and it, but it gives us this one understood store of record that is trust trusted because it's trustless. Um, what, you know, my almost thought is like, does everything like I guess I have this picture in my head that like eventually everything will tie back to it, but then they will have this- All like, roads lead to Ethereum, yeah. I, I kind of feel that way. <laughs> I, I don't, like, I, I, I do feel that way because I think that there is an element where the only thing that's gonna like, there, the interoperability, it almost feels like, it feels like every other blockchain could become an application layer um, that allow, that, or a platform, if you will that allows for all different types of capabilities and things to be built on top of it, as long as it's tied to this one trusted source that everyone kind of aligns and agrees with that says, hey, build your communities, build your ecosystems um, on top of this foundation. I, I struggle with why the, what, I struggle with what's the point of multi foundations, I guess, I, I, cause I under, cause couldn't we do what you're saying culturally and community driven built on um, as an application layer or a platform or a protocol built off of Ethereum? Like, is that, I guess, I, and, I, and I'm not a maxi. By I hear the question. Yeah, yeah I hear the question. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I, like I said, it's, it's, it's hard for me because 
it's not how I see the world. So do you know what would be the most efficient thing on earth? To make every language but English illegal. All <laughs> documents, no more translation problems. You only speak English. Yeah. You only draft legal documents in English. All software code is in English. I freaking guarantee you if aliens came to the world tomorrow, they'd say, you know what? Standardization is a really good idea. So let's yeah. do it. Yeah. So, but it's not going to happen. It's because yeah. humans aren't like that. There's that's some of it is cultural, some of it's the way things evolved. But but seriously, yeah. why do you need TikTok? You need Amazon Web Service Layer and you need YouTube or Twitch. That's all you need. And you can do everything. Why do you need TikTok? You need TikTok because the developers at at, at TikTok or, or at, at YouTube and the developers at Twitch were preoccupied. They've got a they've got a product development pipeline. And it's the nuance, which is what most products are that take off. Slight nuance to something else, right? Or it's a it's a it's a uh, it's a uh, an abstract of it. You know, Instagram was a was just a tiny slice of Facebook, but the slice that led with away with all the friction that people didn't like on Facebook. So that's how I think of your question. So Ethereum, of course, it could be the the kind of the book of record for all chains. Mm -hmm. But there's going to be people who want to do stuff. Mm -hmm. And when they're filing their ERC 5000 request, and yeah. it's like, we'll get to it in three years, there's going to be a group of us that just say, okay, when you do, we'll take a look, but we're doing it now. Yeah, I hear and you. You, you see, you, you, it's just like, I mean, I, I don't know your background, but you know, if you run developer teams, you get overwhelmed. And the more, the longer you're you're building and, and the more products you have, the more you become insular and you're just I attending agree. to these. I, I completely agree with you. I it, it, a part, you know, it was funny. I was at drinks recently, having drinks with the Tezos guys, uh, with some of the guys. Mm -hmm. that we were just on a rooftop in Brooklyn hanging out. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking this, and it's like, this is not fair to think this way, but I was like, damn, there are some brilliant minds in this room right now. I wish they were solving problems on Ethereum because my gas fees are really high. Like that's what I was thinking in the back of my mind right now. And it's, I it's totally not, get it. It's not, so, fair, it's not fair to think that way because these guys are passionate about what they're building, why they're building it, what it creates that's different. But I'm just like, shit, man, we have something going here. We still got to solve like the totally. world. Like there's Tezos, no- Tezos has a great community. You know, to, uh, I, I think Tezos community is second to Ethereum. Now it's a, it's a huge difference. There's brilliant and Ethereum's got, but we, yeah. we've got questions from the audience. I, I just want to ask one one question of, of one more question of William uh, before we open it up to the audience. Um, and that's, you know, you've been, you know, in, in this NFT marketplace really since the beginning um, and yep. you know, since 2017. And, you know, it really wasn't until, you know, late 2000, early 2021 that you really kind of got this dramatic Absolutely. growth. In, in, in what? Yeah. In your view, what, what, what happened? Yeah. Oh man, I'm going to be honest. There anybody who claims they, you know, we all piece together narratives. No one knows, but you're absolutely right, Lou. No one gave a shit about <laughs> NFTs until January 2021. I was thinking, and so were people I work with, that the trigger for mass adoption and and just the super excitement about NFTs was going to be the arrival of um, real consumer uh, priced and and useful uh, augmented reality devices. So because NFTs will be the, uh, the coin of the realm for, for augmented reality. So I thought that was gonna be the trigger, which, which maybe 2024, 2025. So we were sort of building, assuming you've got these super early people who were all having fun, but there's no mass market, right? Wax Cloud Wallet had 250,000, you know, uh, users, and then flash to today, and it's got seven million. And, not, and you saw what happened; it just blew up. But I'm telling you, I I can even give you the day it blew up in January, because we started to notice globally all this stuff happening. I don't. I can make up reasons. I don't know if anybody knows. It's just a social phenomenon. It just well, I, all exploded. I, I will give so I have to give credit to where I think where I think it was going um, because I I'd love to hear. 
I've been preaching crypto NFTs. I bought my first NFT in 2018. I bought, you know, I got into crypto in 2013. Mm. So I, you know, I've been on the word, we invested in super rare and all these, you know, every one of these other marketplaces and companies, but I saw it with Top Shop. Um, NBA Top Shot was the first time that any of my friends responded to crypto, responded to NFTs, responded to anything in this space. I what? never, what? I, my sister, my cousins, my friends, everyone understood it because it was so easy to understand. We've all collected basketball cards. We've so I hear you. Cards. And I, and I was using it as well. But the problem is in J July of 2020, Top mm -hmm. Shot launched. Yeah, July, was, August, September, October, November. It was the Why January. You know, I mean, yeah, I'll tell you exactly. And I'm one of the people that I think was really close to it. I put 50K into Top Shot uh, in about uh, over time through those first four months. And come January, actually, Feb if you really look at February, I think February 22nd. February, it started to really pop. January, January began. February, February 22nd, my $50,000 investment was at, at that point worth $4 million on Top Shot in that portfolio. And when you start sh telling your friends about, holy shit, this 12, this, I bought a, a, a John Moran for a thousand bucks and I just sold him for 80. Like that, everyone wants to be a part of that because at the end of the day, we are in the speculation phase with NFTs, just like we were in the speculation phase with totally. phase until we went through the winter and then DeFi came out and brought utility to all that speculation. We are right now in the yep. speculation phase of NFTs. And that means the first use case of this space is about people uh, jumping on the bandwagon, collecting and profiting until we get to gaming and then the metaverse where the natural native user experience and utility will be offered to these asset classes. But right now it's a speculation game and profit is what brings the users. That's how I see it. And Top Shop is where we saw it first. It's, it's very true, at least with with the, uh, so I agree with the, almost all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I still don't know about the top of thing because it just, I don't know why January, but but yeah. let's say for now, that's a decent, good enough reason. But um, uh, you, of course, NFTs have these just massively, they're computers, right? So whatever you can program, mm -hmm. you can do. They're going to extend way beyond uh, even the stuff we've identified. Oh, totally. Uh, uh, so so far, mm -hmm. and uh, I I would say I've already seen it with virals. Those are uh, NFTs linked to real world items. Uh, virals, uh, when when we when we sell those, they they it's one minute. We'll sell out a hundred thousand of them. Now that's not really speculation per se. It's just people want a digital twin associated with something they already wanted. <laughs> I definitely agree with you that the, because it, it is, it's just easier and it's, it's something people like to have. They like to have that, that, that digital way to express what they already bought. Wow. But um, it, it's, it's also, I think it, there's a bit of, of uh, just people getting comfortable with how this whole system works. You know, the vast majority of even blockchain people, I, I learned this when we did Tether, they don't understand the difference between digitization and tokenization, right? And so as you learn about what tokenization means and why it's so much more beneficial than, than any other way usually of wrapping any object, mm -hmm. I do see um, an explosion of use cases happening, but, but around the broad concept of the NFTs, just, you know, not just things that are non-fungible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. non and you will need a lot of scale a lot of scale in your systems to work. Yeah. Right, Lou, uh, real quick, just before you know, we, we bring up Darren, I just want to ask one question to almost every, everyone really quickly, including you. What was the first NFT you bought and where did you buy it? I'm actually curious. Like Jake, I don't know if you want to kick it off, but do you remember your first NFT? Yeah, it was a Top Shot pack at some point last year. Um, and it was when you could buy Top Shots totally ah. freely. Yep. And I bought like probably 10 packs for $9 or $9 each, something like that. Um, wow. And it was, yeah, I mean, it was, I, I think, I think you're, you're, you're for 90 yeah, bucks, yeah. thousands. Yeah. yeah. Your, your point is well taken though. I do think, I do think the thing that's hard to separate out is the, definitely the IP use case and we all did it as kids. And so we could immediately wrap our heads around it. Mm -hmm. Plus the fiat onboarding. I mean, I, I think if it didn't have that and you had to go through all the MetaMask layers and everything, I think it would have been, Yeah, I mean, I don't, it would not have been the rocket ship that it was. It was no, the fact I, I that you could go yeah. in with a credit card and buy these things as you knew a speculative bubble was going on, um, yeah. which I, I, I think, you know, that's just like 
connecting the dots backwards. Like you need totally. both. Totally. I, and I think that the, the IP thing is a great point because like my first wax NFT was Street Fighter. It was because I related to the I related to the yeah. um, IP. That was my first entrance into wax. Yeah, mine Street too, Street. actually. Yeah. yeah, that was like that was the first time that I was really like, mm. oh shit, I, I, this is a new IP that I relate to, and I want a piece of that. That was my first wax experience, actually, was Street Fighter. So I agree with you, NBA. Like, so my my personal one was super rare. I got into art early on, so I started buying up one of one pieces of art. Um, I actually didn't even understand the concept of multi edition for a very long time. It took me a while to actually resonate with multi editions. Um, Lou, what was your first? You get it now. I, I do now. I honestly, I, I do. I, I think there's a lot to that. Actually, I think fractionalization, multi edition, are going to be huge parts of this of this economy. Um, Lou, what was yours? Mine was actually um, for Crypto Monday. We started making NFTs. The first NFT we made uh, was of um, Mike um, Dudas, you know, from <laughs> The Block. <laughs> and it was an <laughs> NFT of a picture of, you know, with the date of the Crypto that? Mondays. Uh, I need he to see was speaking at. And, and it also gave you utility of a free month of The Block. Oh my God! I got to. You got to send me a picture. Uh, and, how, much, how much is that picture of dude? That's worth. Yeah, I need a picture. I need a picture of dude. Really? <laughs> um, and well, what was your first? Uh, I, 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 not sure. We, I'm not sure. It was almost certainly Crypto Kitties. We bought. I want to say 100 and maybe 120 thousand Crypto Kitties. Uh, <laughs> We, 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 we put them on Omskins. We just wanted to see if anyone would buy them. By the way, the answer was no, they did not. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think we were doing about 10 US dollars every 24 hours with 100,000 plus CryptoKitty and NFTs. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, initially I was like, you know, this, of course, there was a flaw in the mechanic that they had oh. that led to that problem. But uh, uh, yeah, I... I I mean, still have a lot of those, you know, what, uh, what we're doing with them, I don't know. But uh, I, I definitely don't know the first one, but I was just like, buy as many as you can, put them on the site, see if anyone wants them. Yeah, with it. Um, there you go. Oh, Darren. Well, great. We'll, get the first, uh, we'll go to questions from the audience now, a little later than usual, but our, our first question is from Darren. Darren, you want to unmute? So yeah, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me okay? I warned the panelists that my connection is weak. So testing? Yeah, no, we, we, we hear you. Okay, my question is, thank you for the excitement and uh, information. My question is, is what is the best way to invest in today? So you can add a little bit there. What's the best way to, is it, what's the best way to invest in NFTs today? No, in metaverse today. Oh, in the metaverse today. Okay, great. Jake, you want to start? Uh, sure. Um, you know, I think of it. I think of it uh, across essentially two different paradigms. I think there's basically, you know, as as we've talked with a lot of folks in the in the space and a lot of companies in the space. Um, there's essentially, the way I think about it at least, is essentially there's this outgrowth of closed metaverses, which are basically sandboxes that people are building for other people to come and, and build within. I think there's a lot of exciting projects in a bunch of different directions there. Um, you know, projects that have been in the works for four and five years that are now sort of like at the right level of maturation and, and can really welcome users and, and even more importantly, welcome developers in that ecosystem to build great product, you know, I'm thinking of things like Sandbox, um, where, you know, people can can build in there, users can go in there, there's clearly like a critical mass of, of pre-sales and interest going on. So I think there's basically, you know, a, a, a lot of a lot of excitement and interest in a lot of these closed metaverses. And then I think, you know, I think there's broadly this open metaverse built, you know, in some ways on Ethereum and in some ways on other chains. Um, but this idea that, you know, a lot of the profile picture projects and a lot of that type of behavior that's sort of awkwardly sitting on top of Web2 platforms today, but is essentially the metaverse of people wanting to live online, people wanting to perform jobs online, people wanting to, to show off and have, you know, brag online and have your punk or your ape as your 
profile picture, like that type of behavior, I think sits more freely in this open metaverse concept, um, which today lives in, you know, on Twitter and in Discord and, and a whole bunch of other places. Um, and so I really, I view it as, as both of those things playing out simultaneously. Um, and I think there's a lot of interesting ways to gain exposure to, to both of those, those paradigms as, as they're playing out in real time. William? Thanks, Jay. Um, well, what I do, I guess, uh, <laughs> I would take a basket of chains that have a, maybe at least a top three use case of that chain is NFTs. And I would be buying tokens in those NFTs. I'm assuming you maybe wouldn't have access, you might, but you wouldn't have access to the equity or the seed round because those are harder to get into. But if you're just talking, how do you do it simply? Uh, it's pretty easy. You, uh, in fact, it's the approach my partner and I have taken for over 20 years. Uh, you, you, you buy the basket. So look at the NFT chains. Uh, you could, you never know which one's going to be the best. So, and frankly, we own all of them. We own, we have investments in all the ones that we see. Uh, so that's the easiest. Obviously, then look at the, uh, the, uh, the areas where there are friction points with NFTs, obviously wallets, wallets is huge. So if you see and have an ability to invest in a wallet that is, does a particularly good job with NFTs, I would do that. And then on the payment side, a little more difficult, but of course NFTs are ultimately only gonna go mass market if payments is made simple. And so if there are uh, payment processors that are focused on that area that you can get into, beautiful, do that as well. So think about like all the elements that make the NFT universe work. Uh, you could say IP as well, a little harder to own, but you know, if you think there's some great IP that ultimately is gonna be turned into NFTs, you can get a piece of that, do it. But don't do just one thing, right? Yeah. Do be as broad as you can because uh, you can win 10 different ways and you don't know what the best winning strategy is gonna be. So take it as a blanket, investment approach just just get a participation in in as many broad areas of the nft universe as you can like i said that's that's what we're doing i'll uh, i'll add something really quickly because you know that's pretty much what i do is invest in the metaverse um mm -hmm. one uh back my syndicate redbeard ventures were invested on the equity side in um mm. super world in sandbox in green park in wilder world in um awesome say, super world sandbox green park Wilder World and Upland. So we're, you know, we're in, we're, I'm, uh, our belief right now is to take a broad approach to the metaverse space. Um, we want exposure, we want um, coverage, we want, and then we take an ecosystem approach as well. So like, you know, we're also invested, I would consider Dapper Labs in and of itself a, a, a building a somewhat of a metaverse, if you will. And, you know, we're invested in Dapper Labs, the equity company, we're invested in the token on flow, we're invested in the NFTs. And then we're now investing in companies that are building on top of that platform, like Dudili or Round 21 or et cetera. So I think, you know, t thinking about ecosystem investing is really important. I think that, um, uh, and I think that also think about it, I, I agree with what William was saying in terms of like, there is a lot of ways to invest in this space. It's the, there's the equities, there's the assets, but then there's also the picks and shovels infrastructure. There's going to be a lot of really exciting opportunities. Like if you don't know which Ford Ape is going to win, okay, that's that's great. But maybe you invest in the Dow tech stack, or maybe you invest in like companies like we're invested in like Collab Land, which allows gated access into different social communities based on NFTs. Or you know we so there's a lot of different you know uh, another company we're invested in is called Roll that creates social tokens. So you know we're you know we we think about there's a lot of infrastructure plays here that can allow you to be able to. Um, get exposure to the metaverse without having to pick which one is going to win today. So I think that's really important. Mm. Yeah, I, you know, and I'll, I'll just finish up and then we'll go on to the next question with, um, you know, I, I suggest uh, uh, joining Drew's uh, Angela Syndicate. It's a great syndicate. We have a syndicate as well, blockchain co-investors. Uh, we're fund to fund, but we also do one-off investments, um, mostly that we get from the, you know, 26 VCs that were LPs in. Um, and, you know, to William's point too, you know, the, it, it take a basket approach. You know, I suggest that, you know, everybody invests in everything, you know, that goes up and maybe it's just a little bit and those where you have more conviction, you, you know, place a bigger bet in. But, you know, this is a business about getting the massive winners. 
and nobody knows really what those are. And the best way to optimize to get in them is, is to take that basket approach. So great question, Darren. Thanks a lot for that. And our next question is from Violet. Hello, everyone. Wonderful to be here with all of you. Um, so my question is more on the investment vehicle side and next gen and next generation of investment vehicles. I come from a traditional VC structured trade finance background, and I entered the world of blockchain and sort of DeFi about a decade ago. So I'm working on both sides, one like the, the application layers and infrastructure of technologies that we're building, such as Web 3.0, you know, the whole world of tokenomics that supports this space as well as the investment vehicles. And the irony for me is the fact that we are investing in all of these technologies in order to create innovate, innovation and innovate more, yet the investment vehicles themselves are fairly traditional. So given the fact that the crypto infrastructure ecosystem is basically the enabler of Web 3.0 infrastructure and everything we're talking about, and is at an inflection point, still the digital asset space is lacking infrastructure to effectively invest in these spaces, which we can see through the conversations, through the days, and we can see from the questions that come out, right? So the systematic investment vehicles are still lacking and in traditional, like in essence. And I know very few people who are working on it. I'm, it's one of my focuses out of the triangle and the three focuses that I have in the space but what I would like to hear from you guys is as someone who's thinking about this for almost like nine and a half years right now, I want to know from each one of you, like where you see the, the innovation going and what are the, some of the expectations from the next generation investment vehicles? Because in my opinion, uh, what, what really attracted me to the world of fintech and decentralization is the fact that is the community aspect of it, is the fact that there's a lot more layers of people who can actually attend and join the forces of the future. And the investment vehicles should actually reflect that as well. So I would love to know your, your ideas, your opinions, your thoughts on this. And um, if, if any of you is interested, we'd love to also take the conversation <laughs> further offline as well. So Jake, you wanna, you wanna start again? Thanks for the question, Violet. Yeah, I, I think if I understood the, the question correctly, it was what kind of innovations do we expect to come on the, on the investment vehicle side? Um, yeah, I mean, I personally think that there's going to be, you know, an outgrowth of a, of a lot of different, um, different types. I mean, you obviously see all the DAO activity that's going on now and, and, you know, a lot of tooling, a lot of companies building to try to help those groups, um, you know, invest and, and co collaborate and coordinate in interesting new ways. Um, so I, 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 I sort of largely view the, the buckets going forward as like community-based DAO, DAO first type uh, investment vehicles. Um, and I think there's going to be a lot of those and I think they're gonna take a lot of different shapes. And I think we're not even in the first inning of what that's gonna look like going forward. And then I think there's, I think there's still gonna be a role for traditional investor types. Um, I mean, I, I'm sort of supposed to say that, I guess. Uh, but I do think that that um, for for a lot of these companies, investors who are rolling up their sleeves and are very participatory and are helping with the real like company building side of this to help really give greater leverage to the founders and the teams so that they can build their businesses and focus on the most important you know value of creative aspects of the business. I think. I think there's going to be a role for those people for, for a long time. I think, you know, I think what you're hearing is that there's a lot of capital obviously sloshing around. And so founders have a lot of options. Um, but I do think that, you know, either I think founders are going to look for basically value add on the company building side and or value add in the community building side. Um, and there will be different mechanisms for each of those. I mean, I think of the work that Drew does and, creating community around a lot of the businesses that, that he invests in. And um, so I, I think, I think if, if you're not delivering one of those two things, there's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be a, a harder, a harder road. Um, but I think, I think those two, I think company building and community building will, will always have a role for, uh, for these teams. Thanks, Jake. Um, William? Um, I don't have much to add. 
Yeah, <laughs> appreciate uh, that. Drew? Yeah, I could just, you know, I think there's a few things happening. I think one, I think that there is a democratization of investing happening in general. Um, you know, I think that was, you know, why we started the syndicate to start was like, I like this idea of, of having lots of different people at the table to be able to um, participate in and support different deals. So that was where, you know, when we first started that, and it, it's growing like a weed. So I was, it was fascinating to see, and you're seeing public funding and you're seeing all of this. DAOs are wild. I mean, I'm now involved in three of them. Um, I don't know what the hell is going to come from this whole space. I think there's a lot of learning to do. Um, it's someone sent a tweet recently that I thought was really, it hit me hard. Um, it was like, would you rather have part-time geniuses or, you know, full-time average, you know, work with contributing workers? <laughs> I'm not, I'm so far now in three DAOs and I don't know the answer to that. So I want to, <laughs> so we'll find out, we will find out eventually. Um, but uh, there is, um, there's a really, there's a lot happening on that side of things. Like we're investing in the Dow stack pretty substantially right now, just to be able to, I do think there is going to be a decentralized version of the LLC or the incorporation. And, you know, those are, and, you know, and, and investment vehicles, et cetera. I mean, uh, listen, the SEC is also this big freaking question mark that nobody really understands. And it's like, I think it's, it's stifling some of the innovation, um, just the uncertainty and the unknown. Um, you know, I'm, I mean, like, I, personally, I think every single NFT asset is an investment vehicle. I, like, I feel like a shareholder of Board Apes. I feel like a shareholder of every other NFT of CryptoPunks. So, like, if you ask me, uh, you know, the whole the whole space is one big um, investment vehicle. I think we're all going to be alt asset investors of the future. Like, that's my thesis when I'm, you know, investing. Really, truly, I, I think that everyone wants to generate. I think the, the future of the space is going to be investing in assets that create passive income streams as well. I think that's going to be a major part of this whole movement um, to create freedom and flexibility for people to do the things they want to work on because they have passive, in passive income streams out of their assets. So, you know, the investment vehicles could be a board ape <laughs> for all we know. I don't, I, you know, there's a lot of really interesting avenues for that. I, I, I'm not exactly sure the answer, but that's yeah. kind of the context I would give you. I, I was on a call, uh, a really good call yesterday, Masari had on uh, DAOs mm -hmm. and uh, one of the speakers uh, described Ethereum as a coordination machine. And I had never really heard it described at that, but I think that's a great construct to think about it. And, you know, the ability now to construct things in all new ways. And that's, I think, going to happen across everything that seems to be happening in the, you know, financial markets first and, and certainly venture DAOs, you know, Meta Cartel, you know, is an awesome uh, uh, VC firm. I think, you know, they're one of the best VC firms in that. Uh, you know, in all of crypto and it's a DAO, um, you know, it's, it's uh, so, you know, I, I think we're in the early days of the innovation, but it's, it's, it's very exciting. I apologize that, you know, we had multiple other questions where at the top of the hour or, or just a couple minutes away. So I end the show always, you know, with, with one last question for the, for the both of you, Jake and, and William, and that's, you know, uh, uh, if you're on the show a year from today, you know, we're talking about the metaverse and NFTs, what do you think we'll be talking about a year from today that we're not talking about today? Jake? Will, why don't you, why don't you go first? Mm -hmm. yeah, Jake, let me go first. William? Sure. Uh, well, I already know what I'm working on. So I would just say, uh, uh, obviously everything being done now will continue to be done in the NFT universe. But um, I think uh, consumer products will be a far bigger part, retail, fashion, consumer products, will be a far bigger part of the NFT universe than, than what exists today in a year. Thanks, William. Yeah, I think, um, I think we'll be talking about, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be on the show and not uh, shamelessly plug Zed Run some more. So I think <laughs> uh, we'll be talking about the first, you know, million dollar race on, on Zed Run and you know, a whole a whole economy starting to be built uh, within that platform with productive assets and jobs and um, a lot of interesting new uh, innovation and in how people coordinate uh, online around around a game. And I think we'll see a lot more games that are built like that, where there's a lot of jobs to be done. There's a lot of people who are earning their full livings online and and people who are living online. Um, and I think that you know, we're just scratching the surface of that today with with profile pictures and, and whatever <laughs> else. And I think um, we'll we'll be shocked by how much uh, all of that evolves over the next 12 months. 
Well, that, that would be exciting, you know, if that, all that came to happen. And, you know, we had a, if, if there's a million dollar winner at, uh, at Zed Run, uh, my prediction would be that Drew owns a piece of it. <laughs> um, and so with that, <laughs> I got a couple in the game. <laughs> I'd, uh, I'd like to thank Jake and, and William. Uh, you guys were awesome. I thought it was a great show. Um, and thanks for everybody. Thank for you. It's fun. And we'll thanks, see you on the next episode. Have a great day. See you guys.